Good morning, everybody. Good to see you here. A warm welcome to you. And we pray the Lord will bless us as we come to worship him today. So it's good to see you here. A welcome as well to anybody watching this service online. We pray the Lord will bless you as you take part in this service and worship of God. The announcements are many. I hope you're sitting comfortably. We we'll hope to get this onto a, a sheet in the new year, maybe, but um, I'm sorry, there's so many. First of all, um, the Sunday School is on today, and a crash is available with a live link to the service through television, if you wish uh, to use that. There's somebody's away already, so that's grand. <laughs> Just to let you know what else is on through the, the week. Midweek prayer time will be on Wednesday at half past seven in my room. And then there will be uh, carols by candlelight service next Sunday. We have special services next Sunday uh, in terms of uh, boys and girls taking part in the morning in our service. And then in the evening, we'll have a special candlelight uh, carol service. And that will be at 7 o'clock. Now, you're all very welcome to come. Uh, we hope that you'll be here. I will be counting. And uh, we we'll hope that you'll come and worship with us. Christmas morning, then, just to give you a heads up on that, will be at our usual time, that's uh, Sunday. So we'll be having our usual Sunday morning time, 10.15, but it will be a shorter and informal service. So please come on Christmas morning and uh, take part as we worship God in that special day. Roe Valley Christian Radio will be broadcasting during the... Uh, period of the 30th of December to the 1st of January 2023 on 106 FM and also online on rvcr.info. Some schedules are available on the vestibule. Uh, I've printed those out and um, you can also find that schedule online. I have a book here by the Reverend Dr. David Clark, who is a former moderator of our church, uh, has spoken here a number of times. He has written uh, this little book, and I'd be looking for a donation of at least eight pounds for it. Thank you. Um, I only have three with me for here today. That's all there is. So um, they've been going very quickly, and they've been very popular. Um, over the last 30 years or so, he has written articles in the Coleraine Times and he has put together various uh, of these articles to raise funds for the Friends of the Cancer Center in Belfast City Hospital. Now the cost of the books has been covered, uh, so they've been printed and paid for, but the money that's raised is actually going straight uh, to the cancer unit. And I know uh, many families have had folks uh, looked after in the cancer unit down there. Um, I've only these few books, they're quickly disappearing. If you'd like one of these, uh, please see me after the service. Ladies, uh, the YPC in Londonderry will be holding their annual Ladies Coffee Morning on Saturday the 7th of January uh, 2023 in the White Horse Hotel at 10.30 a.m. The speaker is Rick Hill, who is secretary to the Council for Mission in Ireland and he's well worth uh, hearing. So that gives you a little uh, view into the future. 7th of January, half past 10. That's the ladies' coffee morning. I know quite a few have gone to that and really enjoyed it. So please bear that in mind as well. This year's uh, envelope, next year's envelopes, I think next year's envelopes are available in the vestibule. So we'd ask you to lift them, but they do have uh, the world development envelopes and we would like those to be returned uh, by the 22nd of January at the latest so if you can look, pick up your pack and then use the world development envelopes uh, by uh, the 22nd of January please any readers who have kindly volunteered to do the Bible readings at the carol service if you'd wait behind and see James, he has a list of the readings. So if you're going to be doing a reading at the carol service, please see James um, at the end of the service. 
And just for your information, there is no evening carol service tonight in Second Lima Valley. So there's no evening carol service in Second Lima Valley. One final announcement, and that is that it is with regret that we announce the death of Rachel MacArthur's daughter, Marlene MacArthur. Marlene passed away through the week, and her funeral will be on Wednesday. We wish to extend our deepest sympathy to Rachel and to the rest of the family circle at this time of bereavement. Those are all of our announcements today. Sorry for so many. We're going to turn our eyes to God, and that's really what we're here for. And we're going to sing uh, our first praise, Joy Has Dawned. And that's really what uh, Christmas is about, about a joy and a hope that has dawned in Christ. Let us stand together and raise our voices in worship.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning. It's a cold morning outside. We gather here, though, and in the midst of the cold, we see the sunshine. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in these dark days of Christmas, a light has dawned, that of the birth of Jesus Christ again being pronounced, proclaimed and glorified. We thank you, Father, that there's a warmth that has appeared in this cool, dark world to warm our hearts and to give us hope. We thank you, our Father, that in the midst of normal, everyday life, with its sadnesses and worries, concerns, pressures, a joy has dawned. And so we pray that in this third Sunday of Advent, our Father, that we would be able to fix our eyes upon you. To realize that you loved us so much that you sent your own son. And so in fixing our eyes upon the God of heaven, we pray that we would see Jesus. We pray that we would see the one who was willing to come into this broken, dark, muddy, murky world and bring joy and light and hope. We pray, our Father, that we would be able to see the child that was born was God coming into this world who would lead a life that was without sin and therefore be able to represent us as a sacrifice for sins. We pray, our Father, that we would see the birth of a child announcing hope to people that so many didn't pay any attention to. We think of the shepherds hearing the good news out in the field. We think of others, Father, who were looking for answers and they found it in Christ. We think of those, Father, who, whenever they heard about the announcement of Christ, felt that their power was being threatened and decided to turn against him. As we listen and get something of the richness of the story of Christmas, we pray that we would not be people who say to Jesus, no room, but rather, Father, welcome. We pray that we would be a people who turn and know Jesus and the joy in him that is offered by faith. We pray that we would know that Savior who assures us of sins forgiven and acceptance before the throne of grace. We pray, our Father, that you'd forgive us our sins. We pray that you'd forgive us for all the things that we have thought, said, or done. And we pray, our Father, that as forgiven people this morning, we pray that you'd warm our hearts and do us good. And bless us here, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have two readings this morning. Um, the first is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. And then from Hebrews chapter 4. So we're just going to read a few chapters, or a few verses, uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Um, Eli um, has been the priest. His sons were following in his footsteps. They have sinned against God. They've been collecting money and offering and holding it for themselves rather than giving it to the glory of God. And that was a big issue. And an announcement is made that Eli will be the last of his line because his sons will die. But then a promise comes along uh, from verse 30. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. And Eli was to lose all of his priestly office. And then we read in verses 35 to 36. 
I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house and he will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him and for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead, anoint me to come some priestly office so that I can have food to eat. And then we move over to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read verses, um, I have 14 to 10 written down, that's not right. Where are we going to go from 4 to 10? That would be, that'd be a lot better rather than going backwards. Um, Hebrews 4 and from verse 4 to 10. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again in this passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again said in a certain day, calling it, to, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, and said, Today, if you harden, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It is 14. Sorry. I'm reading the wrong passage as well. Welcome to my world this week. Um, it is 14 to 10. It is it's four, chapter 14. I think I might start again. All those announcements have finished for me. Um, if you look in your Bible, sorry folks, I've got the wrong numbers now. Uh, if you look in the Bible, we'll start again at um, Hebrews 4, verse 14. It goes through to chapter 5, verse 10. So that's what I'm going for. Tw page 1203. 1203. Sorry about that. While you're looking at it up, I also meant to say thank you to everyone who organised the Sunday school party yesterday. Thank you so much for that. I was speaking to some boys and girls and parents and they really enjoyed it. So thank you for organising that. Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14 through to chapter 5, verse 10. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest, after, for a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and are designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own word. That reading makes a lot more sense to me this morning. I'm going to ask the boys and girls to come up to the front, please.
Lovely to see you all here. Some of you hiding around there. That's all right, you're still there. Great stuff. Go into the second row there, boys. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I want to talk to you for a wee minute. Today is the, uh, what Sunday of Advent is this? How many have we had so far? How many have we had? Well, two so far, and this is the third one today, isn't it? So that means that we're, we're lighting the candles as we go along. We have the first Sunday of Advent, the second Sunday of Advent, the third Sunday of Advent, and that's today, which means there's how many left? One. That's right. So this day of fortnight is Christmas Day. Isn't that exciting? So we have one more Sunday preparation, and then we'll have um, the... Christmas Day. And the brilliant thing is next week I hear so many of you are taking part in the morning service too, so that's going to be brilliant. And I really look forward to that. So we have a special time ahead. And I want just for a little minute to talk to you about something that Jesus does. <coughs> in the world today, there are people who have a job called ambassador. They're an ambassador. And that really means that because the prime minister of the country can't be in every other country at the same time, he sends ambassadors and they represent the country that they're from and they go to a different country and they talk about the things that they're interested in. So the United Kingdom government will send an ambassador <coughs> to America or to Mexico or to somewhere else and they'll go and they'll talk about how to sell things to each other They'll talk about how to make sure they're uh, being safe with each other and defending each other. And then they'll also talk about peace deals, making sure that everybody stays friends. And so ambassadors go along to a government in another place and they represent them. But it's all about countries and it's all about big numbers and it's all about the very important things that happen between countries. They don't represent individuals. Now, imagine I decided to send an ambassador to another country. And I sent the ambassador in, and the ambassador arrived before another country, and they would say, hello, you're an ambassador, who do you represent? And he said, Jeffrey Jones. They would look very strangely at the ambassador and say, does he have any oil? No, he doesn't have any oil. Well, then we're not interested because we only talk to countries. Ambassadors are only worried about big things and big countries and big numbers. They don't worry about small people. And countries, whenever they're talking to each other at that kind of level, they don't talk about individual. They talk about things in millions. And I don't know about you, but there's only one of me and there's only one of you, isn't there? And in many ways, we're very small. And so ambassadors seem to talk about the big things and the important things. And maybe you and I would feel very small and insignificant because of that. But you know what the amazing thing is? Whenever we read the Bible and we read about the birth of Jesus, we read about Jesus coming into the world for you and me, for the small people, not just for big countries, and big amounts of people, but he comes into the world for you and me. And not only that, he becomes our ambassador. Imagine that. Jesus says he comes as our ambassador. Now, the Bible calls it a great high priest, but it's the same kind of idea. Because he goes in before the throne of God and he does three things. He speaks or he prays on our behalf. And whenever you look at Hebrews chapter 7, you'll see in the very bottom line a big word, intercede. And that's another word for pray or speaking on someone's behalf. And Jesus is able to go into the presence of God and pray for us. And whenever we have put our trust in him, you'll see one of the lines is that he's able to save completely all to come to God through him. And he prays for us. He represents us. And that's an amazing thing. And then he also makes it possible for our prayers to be heard by God. He says that we can come before the throne of grace with boldness. And then the final thing is he brings us 
into the Father's presence as well. And so while the world talks about big numbers and big people and powerful people, Jesus came into this world to love you and me. And whenever we put our trust in him, he prays for us. He makes it possible for God to hear our prayers. And he also allows us to come into the presence of God and meet him in peace. And so that's something very special, isn't it? Jesus knows you and me, even though we're just individuals and he loves us. And so we pray we'll, you put your trust in Jesus and know his forgiveness today. Now, we'll let you go back to your um, seats. Okay, great to see you. Thanks for coming down. And we'll see you next Sunday. It will be fantastic. Hope you have a lovely time out in Sunday school as well. We're going to sing, um, see him lying on a bed of straw. <laughs> The group we're going to sing a lovely piece for us, so come all you unfaithful.
Thank you. The words are fantastic, aren't they? Now we're going to continue to worship God with our offering. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to praise your name and to be able to say thank you as well with our offerings. And today we present to you our offerings. We pray that you take them and use them to your glory. We thank you, our Father, that we're able to bring a portion of how you've blessed us and return it to, for your use. We thank you, Father, we can also use our lives with our words and our actions, reflecting the love of God to those around us and also dedicating ourselves to your service. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you come into this world, find us where we are, and in enabling us to put our faith in you, you call us to follow you. We thank you, Father, that whenever we follow Jesus, we don't remain the same. We're not a perfect people. But you don't start loving us only whenever we meet perfection. You have loved us. The Lord Jesus gave himself for us. And even as we are, we know that we are loved in him. That he values us and cares for us, maybe even more than we do ourselves. Our Father, we thank you that even whenever we mess up, we have a Saviour we can turn to who knows our weaknesses and we can seek forgiveness. We thank you we have a, a Saviour we can turn to whenever we feel weak and we know that he will strengthen us. We thank you, our Father, we have a Saviour we can turn to whenever we feel broken and we know that he will heal, comfort and strengthen. Our Father, we thank you for this Christmas season and we pray that we would make the most of it by reflecting upon the love of God, the birth of a Saviour, whose name is Jesus and who did come to save people from their sins. Today, our Father, we remember members of our congregation unable to be here today because of ill health and we pray, Lord, that you'd draw near them. We pray that you'd bless them and comfort them on this Lord's Day. We pray for those who watch this service in their own homes, unable to come and join us here. We pray that you'd bless them and that they too would be blessed even as they watch this service and have their eyes fixed upon Jesus. We remember those in hospital or nursing homes or in their own homes who are unable to come here today, need your loving care, need a touch from yourself, we pray that you would draw near them and bless them and be with them. We pray for families who have concern for loved ones today, our Father. We pray that you would enable them to know what it is to leave everything in the friend Jesus. 
We pray, our Father, that you would hear our prayers as we move towards Christmas time and we have so many special services coming along. We pray that the services next Sunday, morning and evening, would be special for us all as we come together to raise our voices together and read God's word together. And we pray that as we move towards Christmas Day, that we would be amazed afresh at the love of God. Our Father, we pray for those who are struggling in these days. We pray that you draw near them and bless them. It can be any one of us at any time. But we pray, Father, you would draw near. We pray that the government would decide to start to work together and act together and circumstances would be such that people would return to power here in the assembly and seek to help. <coughs> if they can't fix a problem, at least they may be able to alleviate some of the issues. <coughs> Father, we know it's very easy to say, well, these problems didn't occur overnight, so the answers don't come overnight. But at least sometimes whenever people are working together, they can start to get the answers. And we pray, our Father, that would be the case in the coming days. And at least the community around us would know then that the politicians are seeking to do something. Our Father, we're mindful of the pressures in the NHS from GP surgeries through to hospitals themselves we, and out in the district. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with those who are seeking to help those who are ill. We pray that you'd sustain them, give them that strength and that uh, wisdom and insight necessary to be able to treat so many people at, at such a quick pace. We pray, Lord, that we would be also a bit more patient waiting on the phones to get through as well. Father, we pray that you'd enable us to appreciate all the efforts of those who are seeking to care for us. At this time of year, our Father, we remember those uh, who need help. And we pray that through food banks and other agencies, they may be able to find the help that they need in the coming days. So, Father, we pray that you'd hear our prayers today for ourselves and us in this uh, service. But even as we are able to look at the warmth and the love of Christmas, we're mindful of those who also, as life goes on, also mourn. And we pray today for Rachel MacArthur and Marlene MacArthur's family circle. We pray to be with Rachel following the loss of her daughter so soon after the loss of her son-in-law. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with her and strengthen her and comfort her. And we pray for the rest of the family circle as some travel a distance to come home for the funeral on Wednesday. We pray that they'd be able to arrive safely. And we pray that you'd comfort and keep that family circle today. So we leave these prayers with you. We pray that you'd hear them in Jesus' name. Our next praise is See Amid the Winter Snow, born for us on earth below. Let's stand together and worship God. <laughs>
Well, time's moving on, so we'll have to see how we get on here. The prophecies about Jesus take, a, I suppose, two main ways. One, we see in Genesis chapter 3, 15, and then into Abraham, the promise of an offspring who would come, who would be a deliverer, a saviour. And there's that line that's brought through different people all the way to the birth of Jesus. Not only is he going to be of a certain offspring, a certain line of people, but he's also going to be someone who would fill in per perfection different offices of um, that God has used to highlight uh, the salvation that Jesus is to bring. Last week we saw one of those offices was the ultimate prophet who came not only with a message from God to people, but was the message himself. Today we're going to look at the Jesus being the ultimate priest. If you like, the prophet was to represent God to people and pass on God's message to them. In one sense here, the priest is to be the people's representative before God. But Jesus is not only going to be the ultimate priest, he himself is going to be the ultimate sacrifice that's made. And so you can see this kind of uh, clarity that comes. The prophet speaks, but is the message himself. And Jesus the priest comes and the sacrifice that he watches over uh, is, him, is his own. The priesthood was established back in times of Moses and the Old Testament shows us how God directed sinners to approach him. They weren't to take it lightly. In fact, they themselves couldn't run into the presence of God. They had to use mediators, people who were specially chosen who could represent the people before God. People who would pay for their own sins in the first place to be forgiven before they could then sacrifice for others. And the sacrifices that they did were varied in frequency, in numbers, in animal sacrifices, in grain offerings, and all the rest of it. All ways in which God showed that they couldn't run in to his presence. Particularly animal sacrifices showed that a death was required. Blood had to be shed for the payment of sin. They couldn't do that themselves. They couldn't uh, offer their own blood. It had to be through a priest who would represent them. Once a year, the high priest would sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant for his own <coughs> sins and for the sins of the people. And this had to be repeated yearly. The Old Testament will look forward to a day whenever a great high priest would be able to represent all the people and would provide a sacrifice that would once and for all be completed. The fulfillment of all the sacrifices that all that they look forward to would be found in Jesus Christ. The sacrifices were given elaborate instructions about how to be done and carried out and so on. But it was really a way of showing the seriousness of sin and the inability of people to have their own sins washed away. Sin means death. The wages of sin is death. That's the judgment that's there. You will die. That's what we're told in Scripture. That's what the sacrifices were to be told. But the sacrifices also give a message of grace. You see, an innocent substitute could be used to pay for your sins. Now, the goat or the lamb was not that substitute, but the goat or lamb that was used in the sacrifices pointed forward to someone who would come. And Jesus himself is the only perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice on that basis. And so here we see a priest who would oversee sacrifices, but the great high priest who was to come would be the one who would come and sacrifice himself in order that our sins can be forgiven. Sin is a very serious thing. You and I treat it too lightly. 
how can we in any way ever think we could come into the presence of a holy God? Well, we need a representative. We need someone to represent us before God and provide for us a sacrifice where our sins are paid for by an innocent lamb. Let's see how Jesus becomes this priest. There was a priesthood put in place with Moses. It was to represent the people before God, make sure they understood the seriousness of sin and make sure that they could have their sins forgiven. But by the time we get to Eli, here in 2 Samuel 2, the whole thing had become far removed from godly. But in the midst of all of this turmoil, in the midst of priests who were fleecing money for themselves, there is a promise in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. Well, God says, I'm going to fix this. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart. I will firmly establish his house. There is a priest who is to come who will be the ultimate priest, just as there was to be an ultimate prophet. All the other priests who would come would be a way of pointing towards what was really needed. And priests did come and go. They tried their best. Some of them were very faithful. Others were very crooked. But there would be a faithful high priest who would come and he would honour God completely. He would have a priesthood that was everlasting. So there wouldn't need to be a change of different priests at different times. Centuries later, God would fix all of this and send his own son. And this priest and prophet would be like none other because tied in with all of this will be the fact that he's also going to be a king. And we'll look at that next week. And Psalm 110 ties together the idea of the person who will come will be a priest and a king after the order of Melchizedek. Great name that, isn't it, Melchizedek? And simply that refers to a priesthood that will never end. Melchizedek appears and then disappears in the Old Testament. And the idea is that his priesthood still goes on. Jesus will come after the order of Melchizedek with a priesthood that is eternal. This is what Isaiah is looking forward to in Isaiah 52. A priest who would come representing the people and who would give himself away in the great substitutionary sacrifice. It's the way in which the deliverer of Genesis chapter 3 would be able to see the proper deliverance taking place because he himself would present himself as a sacrifice. No more <coughs> um, cows and sheep and goats. The true priesthood would find itself fulfilled in the one who would give himself away as a sacrifice. And therefore his name was Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. He is the mediator. He comes to offer himself up. He comes to make sure that we understand that he is the one able to represent us before <coughs> the throne of God and also be the sacrifice that makes it possible for us to come into the presence of God. Let me draw three contrasts between the Old Testament system and what Jesus fulfills. <clears throat> Firstly, under the Old Testament system, the priests were required to offer a sacrifice for their own sins first. They were sinners. They couldn't go and say, I'll represent you and be your sacrifice. No, they had to have their own sins forgiven before they could go into the presence of God. Secondly, the sacrifices that the priests offered were inadequate. The idea of the way of salvation was that death came through an innocent victim, but the blood of sheep and goats couldn't take away sins, but they could only point to the ultimate sacrifice who would come, 
And then thirdly, the sacrifices of the earthly priests were incomplete. You see, they had to be repeated again and again and again and again. Contrast those three ideas with Christ. You see, the child who was born at Christmas time would fulfill a role that was so unlike the earthly priesthood because he lived a life that was without sin. As the author of Hebrews 7 says, it is fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, unstained, separated from sinners, exiled above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the other people. He himself has no sin. The second contrast is that he himself is perfect and therefore so is his sacrifice rather than the Old Testament's inadequate system. Jesus would pay the price for sin, a perfect sacrifice, and sin would be removed. Christ's death was the actual atonement on the basis for which God declares people forgiven. Lots of places through Hebrews, a great book to show you how the great high priest fulfills that role. And then thirdly, we also see that the sacrifice of the Old Testament prophets had to be repeated daily. But Christ's sacrifice was complete and accepted to God as a resurrection shows. He is sinless, perfect and a once for all sacrifice. And it is he who offers himself as our great high priest. He is able to sympathize with us because he knows our weaknesses. He's fast to hear our confession. He is in many ways able to understand the temptations that we have gone through because he himself went through those same temptations. And then we find those fantastic words in chapter four, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Do you see the offer that's there? What an amazing offer. There's times whenever we get fed up with ourselves and I've done it again. You get frustrated with yourself. But we can be confident that there is acceptance before the throne of grace. We can come in prayer that we may receive mercy and find grace when? In our time of need. Not whenever we have fixed everything, but whenever we're in a time of need. Jesus himself fulfills this ministry. He deals with our guilt and satisfies God's wrath allowing us to know that the wages of our sin have been paid and therefore we can have everlasting life. What does that mean as we look at Christmas and see this child who was to be a priest, a representative for us and pay the ultimate sacrifice? Well, it means this, friends, there's nothing left to fear. There's nothing left to fear. Jesus has dealt with our greatest problem our sin that separates us from God. He has dealt with our sin and our guilt. He has dealt with the wrath of God that rested over us. And today he stands before God interceding for us. That's an amazing thing. And so we can say with confidence the words of the modern hymn, before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written in his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Is Jesus your great high priest, friend? Have you trusted in him and said a meaningful sorry for your sins? Have you asked him to cleanse your guilty conscience and break the bondage of sin in your life, to be present in your heart, to enable you to turn towards God and praise him and glorify him 
and enjoy God forever. That's the great promise of the priest who will represent us. What a saviour. What an amazing privilege to be able to think of the richness that we have in Jesus. May we worship him aright this day. We're going to sing our final praise. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. These are great truths. May they warm our hearts and do us good. Let's stand together and sing. remind you of the envelopes to be collected in the vestibule and if anybody wants one of Reverend Clark's books then please see me at the end. Our Father we thank you for the privilege of thinking through the prophecies of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus allowing us to recognize who he is and to appreciate the richness of the salvation that you have granted to us. May we never get bored or tired of that. We pray that we would know today the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.